On Thursday, I had deadlines, too many deadlines. I needed to write two podcast scripts, finish reading a book and get some questions ready for my interview with the author, answer dozens of emails and WhatsApp messages, sort out my accounts. And as usual, I was all too aware I was behind with writing my next book. So what did I do? Knuckle down and get on with the tasks one at a time, work out which was most urgent and make a start on that. What I see is possibly not what most people would see as the solution to having far too much to do and not enough time to do it. I went into the garden and spent the next 15 minutes deadheading sweet peas, picking tiny slugs off my sprouting broccoli and watering my basil seedlings. And then, after this perfect quarter of an hour of rest, I got on with my work. When we're overwhelmed with the pressure of being busy, forcing yourself to work even harder might seem like the answer, but I want to show you that the opposite is the case. Sometimes the answer is to give yourself a break. So in this talk, I'm gonna demonstrate that we don't take rest seriously enough at the moment. Rest is something we do if we're lucky, when everything else is done. We don't value it for its own sake. And although we might think it's difficult to fit breaks into our busy schedules, there are opportunities to fit more rest into our lives than we realise. And the simple truth is that the majority of us don't get enough rest. It feels as though there just isn't time for it. We have work, which seems to take over. We have a family life. We have a social life as well, or we'd like to if there was time. And it doesn't stop there. There's all the adulting we have to do. We are overwhelmed by our to-do lists. And to make things more pressured, we often set ourselves high standards to look a certain way, to be a better person, to learn mindfulness, to get fit, to cook amazing meals if people come round, and on it goes. Yet relaxation, by which I mean waking restfulness, not sleeping or having a nap, is good for us. It's good for us physically because it reduces blood pressure and heart rates, and it's good for us mentally and cognitively. It boosts our memories and ability to concentrate, while the opposite, fatigue, leads to memory lapses, poor judgment and even accidents. So we need to give ourselves a break. Now, this is not a charter for laziness, I'm afraid, but there is lots of evidence that breaks are good for us. Yet breaks are actually getting rarer. If we think back to the 19th century, the rich people, the gentlemen of leisure, were proud not to work too hard. They would boast of spending time in their London clubs before inviting some friends for a weekend at their country retreat. If you look at the rich and famous on Instagram today, you might see the odd picture of them reclining on a beach, having a fabulous lifestyle. But a lot of the time, they're showing us how busy they are working. In the UK today, only 1% of senior schools now has an afternoon break. And the hour long lunch break in the workplace is becoming a thing of the past. You almost need an excuse like your birthday to do it. Busyness has overwhelmed our lives. It's almost become a status symbol. But what are we busy about? We need to ask what our obsession with busyness achieves. Now, part of the problem is that we do think busy people are better. A researcher called Sylvia Belessa carried out a study where people were asked to judge a fictional person called Sally Fisher based on her Facebook posts alone, which came in two types, which I think of as lazy and busy. So lazy Sally posted things like Wednesday, 1 p.m. long lunch and Friday, done with work at 5 p.m. In another version, Busy Sally posted things like Wednesday, 1 p.m., quick 10 minutes for lunch, no time to stop, and still working at 5 p.m. on a Friday. Now, the participants were then asked what they thought of Sally. Interestingly, they didn't comment on her exceptionally dull Facebook posts. In fact, they thought Busy Sally was a faster worker, better at multitasking, and had a more meaningful job. Now, it's true that sometimes we have no choice and are just too busy, but we need to ask ourselves whether at other times it's us deciding we need to be busy or appear to be in order to look good. Now, I want to tell you about a study called The Rest Test. That and my book on rest came out of a residency I was part of at the Wellcome Collection in London.
A group of us from all sorts of different disciplines came together over the course of two years to examine the topic of rest in different ways. We had composers, artists, neuroscientists, geographers, all sorts. And when people heard we'd won the competition for the grant, they would joke that studying rest for two years would be easy because we could just laze about in there. Now, it's true we did acquire a hammock, but we all worked so hard it was only ever our visitors who got in it. But it was fascinating. And while we were there, what I wanted to do was to find out how thousands of people think about rest. So a group of psychologists from Durham University created an online study called The Rest Test. We launched it on the radio shows and podcasts I present, and then we waited. Would people be interested enough to take part? The answer was yes. 18,000 people from 135 countries took part. And there was clearly a rest deficit, with almost two-thirds of people who chose to take part telling us that they don't get enough rest. Now, of course, they did choose whether to do it, but the questionnaire took, what, 30 to 40 minutes to complete. So I'm hoping the laziest people selected themselves out. But we found there was a relationship between the amount of rest people got and their well-being. In fact, those who get more rest than average and say they don't feel in need of more rest have well-being scores twice as high as those who feel in more rest. Now, I'm not saying the more rest, the better. The optimum numbers of hours of rest seem to be five to six hours. But people who got less than that had lower well-being scores, but so did people who got more than that. We also asked people which activities they found the most restful. We ended up with a top 10 chart style of the most restful activities. And this list is fascinating, partly because of what's missing. My favourite, gardening, isn't in the top 10, nor is eating, that's down at number 21, and socialising is at number 20. Likewise, spending time with pets doesn't make it into the top 10, and sex, well that's down at number 22. But remember, this is the list of the activities we find the most restful, not the most enjoyable, and there is a difference. But it's notable that the top five activities are all things we tend to do on our own. So perhaps in order to rest, what we really need is a rest from other people. And resting can be active. It doesn't have to mean lying on the sofa doing nothing. 38% of people put down walking as restful, that came in at number six, and 8% put running. Some people find they can't empty their minds of those thoughts that can whir round and round in it until they exert their bodies. We also found that resting isn't always easy. We yearn for it, but we can find it makes us feel guilty. Doing nothing in particular came at number five, but of course that can include pottering around, tidying up. And actually doing nothing is, is harder than it sounds. As the French philosopher Pascal noted, all of humanity's problems stem from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. It's so hard that we might even prefer to experience pain rather than be left alone with our thoughts. In an experiment at the University of Virginia, Timothy Wilson left people alone in a room for 15 minutes with no phones, nothing to read, nothing to write with, and they weren't allowed to have a nap. But there was one thing they could do if they chose to. A bracelet around their ankle was attached to an electric shock machine, and by pressing a button, they could give themselves an electric shock. And they all tried it out first, so they didn't just do it out of curiosity. In fact, these were the people in the study who had said they'd be willing to pay not to have another shock. 25% of women and 71% of men gave themselves at least one shock. One man did it 190 times, which is quite good going in 15 minutes. But masochists apart, this does show us how difficult we find it to be alone with our thoughts. It makes us restless. So to rest successfully, you should do the thing you find restful, whatever it happens to be, whether it's running or watching TV or giving yourself electric shocks if you must. Now I've been looking for the essence of rest and the ideal combination of activities to do this. They give you some solitude, distract you and allow your mind to wander without making you feel guilty. Prescribe yourself 15 minutes of rest doing the activity you find most restful as a regular time out.
When I'm working at home, I go out into my little garden in the middle of the afternoon and do, say, 15 minutes of gardening. Now, I used to do that sometimes anyway, because I love gardening, but now I don't feel guilty about it. Just as I run to protect my physical health, this is to protect my mental health. So it's good for me. So do all the things you weren't allowed to do at school. Let your mind wander, doodle, stare out of the window. I give you permission to do all these things backed up by evidence. And if you just don't have time to rest, you can also reframe wasted time as a welcome rest. If you're queuing to pick up a parcel because you missed the delivery yet again, or you're on a platform and your train is late, this is frustrating. But if someone had said to you, would you like the gift of 10 minutes to do absolutely nothing but rest and watch the world go by, you might say yes and enjoy it. Now, this is all much harder for people trying to combine caring responsibilities with long hours of work, but do try it if you can. Put breaks in your diary as well as appointments. Stop fetishizing busyness as a mark of how busy you are and learn to say no to things. You don't have to do everything. If we take rest seriously, we gain numerous and valuable benefits. Just as sleep has begun to be taken seriously, we need to do the same with rest. Rest is good for well-being. It's good for us physically, psychologically and cognitively, boosting concentration, productivity and creativity. Breaks help our memories too. In Scotland, the psychologist Michaela Dewar has done several studies showing that if people memorise lists of words, then rest in a darkened room, they can recall more of those words than people who do something else instead of having a break. And it's even been shown that patients with severe amnesia, who can only remember about 14% of words from a list, can remember a whopping 49% if they have a break in a darkened room. Many of us don't rest enough at the moment. Don't take it seriously, don't value it, and instead value busyness, often to our detriment. We can change that if we want to, with simple adaptations to our lives by doing things which leave us feeling truly replenished. And if we do that, we'll improve our lives, our health and our relationships. So my call to you today is to go out there and take it easy. Relax and don't feel guilty. It's good for you. It's allowed. Do nothing in particular or something that you find restful. And what might that be? Well, as I say, it's whatever works for you. But if you want to know what came out as the most restful activity in the world's biggest study on rest, it might not be what you expect. It's reading. It takes you out of your world into another, and it's the perfect jumping off point for a bit of daydreaming. But that may not be your personal number one. You need to find your own personal prescription for rest. Find the two or three activities which absorb you enough to distract you from your worries, to let you slow down and to leave you feeling restored. Then allow yourself permission to do them. And I shall be heading back to the garden because those seeds won't plant themselves. <laughs>